Welcome back to the 1010th Podcast. My name is, of course, Michael Beck with Adam Nielsen and Mr. Robbie Bierhout. And we have a guest this week. We have Mr. Ross Bentley. How you doing, Ross? I am doing excellent. Um, as, the car geeks. Yeah, exactly. It's just a room <laughs> full of car geeks. Um, as a way of introduction, Ross is the mind behind um, the Speed Secrets series of books. Um, he's done a number of things. He's been a race car driver for many, many years, including racing in the 24 Hours of Daytona. Um, some you indie d- car stuff. Done some indie car, um, and just now, um, kind of getting into podcasting. You've kind of got your feet wet into that. Yeah, I think uh, driving an indie car is more difficult than podcasting. I, I believe sorry, that. I don't doubt that for a second. Is more difficult. Podcasting yeah. oh, is more no, difficult. Gosh, no. Oh, wait, we can wait, podcast. Wait I'm quite yeah. certain we're not qualified <laughs> to drive indie cars. It's probably see, true. See, I blew it there. You know, <laughs> that's how difficult <laughs> podcasting is. Yeah. Um. So. Can you introduce us a little bit to how you even got into this industry? Because I don't, I don't know exactly how you got your start. I mean, I know you, like we talked about, you kind of got a little bit of your start in Indy and, and, you know, racing at that level. But how did you actually get into this industry as opposed to doing anything else? Uh, you know, I, at, at an early age, they removed part of my brain. <laughs> and uh, then I became, no. Uh, so my, 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 my dad took me to my first race when I was five years old and, you know, I kind of say at that, I can, I can still remember that night at a local oval track, um, watching the cars go around going, uh, oh, this is what I'm going to do. And, and, uh, I just never really grew up. Uh, I think I was, I'm going to say eight or nine or something like that when I kind of learned about the Indy 500 and I went, okay, that's what I need to do. I need to go and race at Indy. And so it was really not a, for me, it was just, it was kind of not even a, a decision. It was just what I was going to do. I was going to go racing. And so, you know, the typical thing, you start off and spend all your money on your first cars and eventually, you know, I bought a Formula Ford and raced that for a couple of seasons and sold that and got a guy that owned a Formula Atlantic car and he asked me to drive his car. So I did that for a few seasons and then kind of just kept trying to work towards racing Indy cars. But I would... I could never put together the money to do it, uh, to, to do a, I'm going to say a full season of competitive racing. So, you know, I could never really, you know, like a lot of guys will put together the budget and they'll go and race and they'll win one of the, the ladder series, uh, championships. And I can never get the money together to do that whole season like that. But over the course of, I don't know, six, seven years or something like that, I probably put together the equivalent of one or two great seasons. And, <laughs> Um, you know, fortunately for me, I was, you know, I'm, my hometown is, hometown is Vancouver, Canada. And in 1990, they, uh, they had a IndyCar race, a street race in Vancouver. And there was a bunch of people in Vancouver that went, oh, it'd be really cool to have a local hometown boy in that race. And so a bunch of people got together and helped put some funding together for me to do that. And Spent uh, three or four years, I guess, kind of doing IndyCar stuff off and on as I could put together money. And one season actually got what seems like a lot of money, but was only about a tenth of what the big teams were spending. Um, Got that put together and did a whole season of IndyCars. And really, I guess what the weird thing is, is that once you've driven an Indy car, for, for whatever reason, people look at you as an Indy car driver. And <laughs> a lot of sports car teams then, I, they called me out of the blue and said, hey, would you come and drive our car? And, you know, we'd like to pay you to, to, to race our car. And I'm kind of like, what? You'll pay me to do this? <laughs> uh, so that was, uh, that was kind of a big breakthrough. And then, you know, just spent a bunch of years uh, racing sports cars, prototype cars and some GT cars and things. And um, been very, very fortunate to do that. The, the I guess, and not to make this too long here, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of people find their, you know, what they love to do and hopefully what they're good at. And I was, I, I love driving race cars and I was pretty good at it. Um, but I also love to teach other people about driving as well. And so a big part of that, you know, my career was spent, you know, using what I was doing in driver training and coaching and instructing and all that kind of stuff to help other drivers you know, I was using that to kind of help uh, pay the bills and put groceries and buy groceries and pay to live kind of stuff while I was trying to make a living as a race car driver. So, uh, 
you know, so fortunately for me, I found two things in my life that I absolutely love more than anything else, which is driving cars fast and helping other people drive cars fast. So did you actually make it into the five, the Indy 500? Did you well, accomplish did, that? Uh, not quite. No? <laughs> uh, so there's a, you know, the, uh, there's another big long story of, so, you know, you go to Indy and you go through rookie orientation where you got to work your way up to speed. And I did all that stuff. And, um, the, you know, then you start practicing and that's, you know, Indy now is down, is now shrunk down into a two week event. At that time, it was a full month long event. You spent the month of May in Indianapolis and, you know, so you practice day after day after day. And then the day before first weekend of qualifying, um, I'm between turns three and four at 220 something miles an hour. And all of a sudden it was like walking into a blast furnace because my car caught on fire and Ooh. methanol fuel squirted from a broken fuel line, squirted into the cockpit on top of me and ignited. Oh no. Oh geez. Now I'm in a fire, a, 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 a v- invisible fire, uh, that's oh, about yeah, that's burning at 1800 degrees and I'm doing 220 miles an hour and trying to get out of the car. So I ended up spending qualifying weekend in intensive care with uh, second and third degree burns on my hands and my face and my neck. And um, long story short is uh, never quite got a shot at uh, qualifying and then couldn't put the money together the following year. And by the following year after that, I was getting paid to drive prototype sports cars. Did you drive um, for Ferrari then when you were driving prototype cars? So the first season, the first full season I did in the prototype cars, um, started the season in a it was a, a spice, a Chevy powered spice, and then uh, the second, no, the third race. I actually did the first two in that, and then the third race, the team owner bought one of the Ferrari 333 SPs, which were one of and still is one of the coolest cars ever built. Uh, oh yeah, the V12 yeah. that. Pop big flames out of the back, and I <laughs> just sounded like a Ferrari should sound. So, yeah. Michael's over there, like, oh man. That's yeah, I need things. I need one of those. That's on my list so of Italian, Italian cars. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, to make you really jealous, because that was the first year that Ferrari had built a a prototype sports car uh, since I guess early seventies, and this was in nineteen ninety. I guess it was. Um, so it had been a long time, and in this, the Ferrari 333 SP debuted at Road Atlanta that year, and I guess it was April. And uh, you know they made a big deal because there were four cars, and you know this is kind of like the world debut of Ferrari's return to sports car racing. And at uh, I guess Saturday night, they took they asked the the drivers of these four different uh, Ferraris to go to this special dinner and we met with the president of Ferrari and he presented me and the other, the other drivers with a solid gold prancing horse. And <laughs> apparently it was given to the, the formula one drivers that drove for Ferrari. They got one of those and I have up on my wall right here. I've got a, uh, a painting, a small painting of that Ferrari and I've got the, the gold Ferrari prancing horse, uh, uh, embedded in the, in the frame of the thing. So it's kind of a pretty cool souvenir. Oh man, that would yeah. be. I should say so. That's pretty awesome. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were racing, obviously you were getting you were getting paid to race for a period of time. Did you feel that there was a natural transition then where you went from being paid to race most of the time to, you know, now I'm doing this coaching thing more to, you know, now I'm just a professional coach or how did that transition happen exactly other than, you know, I just need to pay the bills? Uh I mean it was definitely a it was definitely a transition, um, it, but you know, even while I was getting paid to to drive, I mean, I was coaching and doing a lot of that. And like I said, I, I absolutely love that part of this world, this motorsport world. And and you know, where I think you know today, there's a lot of coaches out there who they're really underemployed race drivers. Sure. And the only reason they're coaching is because it keeps them close to the track and. For them, close, hopefully close to somebody that's got a big bank account that'll pay for them to go racing again. And, you know, for me, it was it was definitely a it was different. It was I absolutely loved to do it. So I studied 
I studied coaching. I, I really kind of really got focused, the mental game, the approach to coaching, um, you know, the whole process of, of bringing out the best in people. And, you know, so for me, it was, there was almost like for a while, there was like two parallel careers. And then, you know, as, as one of them, you know, it was kind of just got to that point. And really my, my driving career kind of got to that point where, uh, you know, I didn't want to go and chase the rides anymore. Like, you know, the life of a race driver where you're constantly trying to find your next drive and trying to find somebody that's going to pay you to drive again when there's somebody over there who will pay to drive um, to take your place. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tough grind. And after many, many years of doing that, that part of it, you know, the balance between the, the, fu- the enjoyment of driving versus the, the work that took to get into that, um, yeah, it started to take its toll a little bit. And, you know, I, so I didn't want to chase it anymore. And, you know, if it happened, it happened. If they came to me, it, it happened. And for still a bunch of years, I got paid to, you know, people would call me still to come and drive. And, but then as the recession sort of came along and teams budgets dried up, um, you know, that definitely, that, that contributed to the end of my driving career. And at the same time, I was just having more and more fun with coaching and enjoying that and being more successful with that. So it kind of just went from maybe a, you know, 80% driving, 20% coaching to the other way around. And, you know, today it's, you know, I, I think last year I drove in three races, uh, just some fun <laughs> stuff. And, uh, you know, I still get to drive every now and then, but, uh, and I'm not saying that I don't miss it, but I, even when I'm at the track and somebody says, go drive my car. I'm like, well, could I coach you instead? You know, like I, I love coaching that much. So how did the book, the series of books, I should say, work into that transition out then? Was that kind of near the end of your more serious racing career where you had this idea to write this book or where did that come from? No, that was a, that was a total accident kind of a deal is it was actually uh, late nineties. No. Yeah. Late nineties. Um, so actually earlier on than that, earlier, even before I got into driving Indy cars, um, I'd started a high performance and race driving school and I kind of just went, okay, I started the school. I need to give my students something. So I kind of wrote out a, I don't know, a five page little document, a uh, little handbook thing to give to the students as part of their, you know, their, their, uh, involvement in the school and coming and taking a course. And each year I'd update it and update it and update it and kept adding more to it. And then when I was racing Indy cars, um, I kept sort of kind of merging my own notes. Every weekend I would write down notes of what I learned and I'd kind of merge that into this document and it kind of kept growing and growing and growing. And one day I showed it to a friend who then showed it to another friend who was a journalist and he said, man, this is a great book. And I'm like, yeah, right. And he says, no, no, <laughs> here, send it to this publishing company, company, Motor Books International. So I did and they came back and said, hey, we want to publish this. And that was in 1998, I guess, it was published, that first one. And, you know, about the time that it came out, I realized, geez, didn't even really get into the mental part of this sport. So myself and another fellow that I'd been working with, uh, we wrote Inner Speed Secrets book. And then I'm still traveling around and coaching and racing. And I kept adding more and keep writing. And eventually writing sort of became my hobby. And I get on a plane and I pull up my laptop and I'd start writing. And I just kept writing more and more and more, and <laughs> publisher kept saying, "Give us more." So, um, kept writing more and more books, and uh, you know, what two or three years ago, uh, they asked me to kind of merge some of my books, and I merged a, a few of them, and then added some more and updated some stuff, and that became the Ultimate Spe- Speed Secrets book. And I went, "Okay, that's it, that's it, I'm done." And then early last year, they came along and said, "Hey, how about writing a book called?" the lost art of high performance driving around the whole thing of cars that have uh, stability control and traction control and do everything for you. And so I wrote that last year and it'll be published. It'll be supposed to be released, I think around June or July of this year. So, Oh, cool. So the, the books have big were you know, I was the kid in school that was voted most unlikely to ever write a book. <laughs> uh, you know, that was not something I did, but, uh, you know, I must admit that it has become probably the best marketing tool or marketing device that I've ever had because, you know, I've been, 
you know, I've, I've had I've gone coaching and done seminars and workshops in what Sweden, Estonia, uh, England, Korea, China, Australia, and all of those were because they wanted the guy that wrote the book. Um, sure. Kind of a kind of silly in some ways, but it's opened a bunch of doors for me. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. So, how many books are there? Uh, I think there are. I'm, I'm You're looking, book. yeah. Let's count, let's count them all. Because <laughs> I'm going, okay, so there is six, and then the autocross book is seven, and then Ultimate Speed Secrets is eight. And then I wrote uh, I wrote Bob Bonder on, on kart racing, go-kart racing. Um, so, And then the next one. So I guess I'm going to be up to ten, I guess. So. Wow. That's, yeah. that's pretty prolific, really, I would think. <laughs> so it's interesting you, you bring up – your your next book, and I don't want to I don't want to ruin that for you or for anybody else. But your your so your next book is going to be about um, this new thing that's come about in the last probably more seriously in the last twenty years or so um, with with the public being able to have access to stability control, obviously ABS and other driving aids. But you know we the three of us don't have any cars that have those types of systems in them, and so that's kind of the driving <laughs> that we're used to. Um, Robbie, you don't even have ABS, do you? No. You don't have ABS either? Nope. So uh, from your yay, I will take that to mean that that's, that's the way that you would prefer it to be. But, I mean, seriously, what's your take on the technology and how that's changed driving for the you know the typical weekend racer? Well, I think, you know, whether you're, you're participating in autocross, HPDE, track day stuff, club racing, you know, a lot of this, you know, low – low cost, uh, budget endurance racing, those kinds of things. Um, y- you know, I think, I guess what I've seen is a lot of drivers that they re- end up relying on, and it, probably more the track day guy that, uh, you know, is relying on the systems in the car and they don't know that the systems are keeping them alive, um, or at least on track or on course kind of thing. And, you know, so when I said, yay, I think, I think everybody should at least spend some amount of time in a car with little to no of these electronic nannies. You know, ABS, okay, I can, I can live with that entirely. But even that, I mean, just, you, you know, you develop the sensitivity in your foot so much more if you've got to modulate to make sure that, you know, if you do lock up, you can come back out of it and that kind of thing. And, you know, it's the same thing with coming out of a corner and standing on the throttle and letting the stability control uh, keep the car pointed in the direction you want to go um if you if you've learned how to do that without that when you do end up with those nannies and i don't have any problem with with driving with them is but you know i think everybody should have driven and developed their sensitivity prior to having those yeah absolutely that makes sense you think about you know in in when i drive the fiat or whatever you've got when you talk about not having any ABS, you have to be careful and cognizant of where your foot is and how hard you're applying the brake and how much pressure and all that. And so your sensitivity to what's happening through your feet is is higher than somebody who's just going to stab the brake and know that it's going to be okay because the car is going to take over and it's not going to you know it's not going to slide into a wall or in, into the into the pit or anything like that because um, you know he's got the electronic aids. So I mean. I, I would agree it definitely probably hones those skills a bit more. Um, but it'd be it'd be interesting, you know, I'm not saying I'm the best driver by any means, but it'd be interesting to drive a car that has those those aids. Do you think that they add anything to um, the driving experience for someone that's kind of got moderate experience? Or um, do you think it's, it's still kind of sours some of their learning capability? Well, I think, you know, and... and before you know somebody just goes oh man boy that guy really is old and (laughs) out of date and uh you know you know in my day kind of a guy no Mm -hmm. no because because i actually think that you know driving with uh the electronic controls are i mean it's fun if you know how to use them in fact you know i i love getting into a car that does have stability control and then kind of squeezing in the throttle coming off a corner and kind of just using just a tiny little bit of it just enough of it and you know you can kind of just use it you know but i'm using it um proactively on purpose as opposed to i stood in the throttle did something 
not only maybe not stupid, but you know, did did something way beyond what the car is capable of, and now it's reacting to that and saving me. So I think if you use these electronic um, devices and you use them in a proactive way, and you know when they're helping you and when they're not helping you, I think it's fantastic. And in fact, you know, it it makes our sport a little safer. And if it does that, then that means more people will go out to tracks and autocross courses and whatever else and do more. So I think, you know, on one hand, I'm like a huge fan of all those things. And on the other, I just go, but learn how to drive without them in the beginning, like really learn that part of it. Um, You know, if it was up to me, everybody would start off in a, uh, the example I use all the time is an E30 BMW or, uh, or a Miata something like that that's relatively low horsepower per weight, um, doesn't have a lot of electronic nannies to save you. And when you get really, really, really good with that, then start upgrading to all the other cool stuff. So, yeah, on that point, I mean, what if if somebody's looking to get into the sport, whether it be autocross or track days or something like that, is there some advice that you have for people as far as, you know, what kind of car they should look to get into or what's the best way to enter into racing at some level, probably more autocross or road course? Uh, almost doesn't matter. Just go do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, if, if you're driving a minivan, take your minivan out. Uh, I just a big believer in get involved in, in anything you can. Hey, if in the perfect world, yes, like I said, I would, I would recommend something with fewer electronic, uh, controls, you know, stability control, traction control, that kind of stuff, than more of those. Um, I guess the other thing is, in, is, you, a, a good friend of mine in racing, you know, his advice was always um, go in, you know, his, his and it's focused on racing, but his advice for racing is go and compete in a series where you can have the biggest budget. So, you know, if, if, you, if you've got $1,000 to spend, go spend it somewhere where $1,000 is the big budget in town. If you've got $20,000 to spend, Go and spend it where twenty thousand is a is a big budget, but if you've got two thousand dollars to spend and you go and you go and compete in a race series that most people are spending ten thousand dollars, you're just going to frustrate yourself. So same kind of thing. I think um, you know if you're going to go out autocrossing, I think you're better off starting in a in a lower powered, less expensive car and really really focus on your driving. And do that, and then over time you can upgrade to faster and more expensive cars when when it feels right to do so. So, uh, long answer to a simple question, <laughs> you know. That's yeah. kind of how it always goes, though. Not necessarily yeah. a simple question, but that was kind of my question. Was you know I've gotten a, f- a few track or not track days, autocross days under my belt, and I'd like to get into track days and move forward with that and i'm kind of the opposite of adam i've i've got the uh wheel to wheel bug and i i I want to know what that that's like and i might be lucky enough this year to be in a chump car race or a lemons race what would be advice for from you to me on the correct way of going about it like should i take a driving school um do i focus on h h I never get this right. H-P-D-E. HPDE. You know, stuff yeah, you know. spell HPDE. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, again, I think it's uh, it almost doesn't matter, but just don't go into something that, you know, you're so totally stretched financially that um, you know, then you're worried about being stretched financially. You know, I think, you know, one of the great things about the whole Lemons, Chump Car, World Racing League, uh, um, Lucky Dog, those kinds of series that are out there now is, you know, it, it is a way, it is way more um, accessible than it's ever been before. And I think, uh, you know, one of the great things is that, you know, you could, with, with not a whole lot of effort, you know, you can look around and find some team that's going, you know, give us 500 bucks and come out and spend the, the day driving the car. And you're going to get a lot of seat time because the races are long. So, um, you know, to me, the only kind of my, I guess my two big criteria for ever saying no to something like that is number one is, is it safe? You know, if you look at a car and you go, Hmm, I don't know about that. Then don't get in that car. <laughs> uh, you know, make sure the car is safe because 
I don't, I don't care what you're driving and what speed and what event you're in. You know, there's something that can go wrong. So I think for sure, make sure it's safe. And the second thing is, uh, go hang out with good people that are fun to be around. Um, you know, I know of people that have, you know, they paid their whatever, you know, a few hundred bucks or whatever it is to go and do a chump car or lemons race or something like that and had an absolute blast. And I've had some that are going, yeah, it was kind of fun, but man, the team that or the other drivers I was with, they were a bunch of jerks. And I was mm-hmm. like, that's not why we're in this sport. We're, we're here to have fun. So um, exactly. People yeah. make or break anything regardless of what you're doing. So. Yeah, exactly. And I think th- the nice thing is um, we've been very fortunate with people that listen to the podcast that are fans of the podcast and, and people that we, we respect or have other shows or, you know, are well known for, um, you know, even just a local community for what they do. But, uh, you know, we've had people that have offered us seats in, in different cars or, you know, asked us if we would go do a race with them or something like that. And so I think we'll have the opportunity to do some wheel to wheel definitely. Um, and we're really looking forward to it. And the nice thing is we can get into it, you know, with somebody else's, team and somebody else's car not to say that we want to just completely hijack everything that they've done to put together their team in their car but you know i think i think that'll be i think that'll be a good introduction for us and um a few of those of those teams have said hey you know if you come out and run with us for the weekend you can get your competition license or you know whatever and stuff like that so i'm hoping that that's kind of a nice entry for us in 2017 into more wheel-to-wheel racing i think i think that's great and uh you know, Robert, you, you asked the question sort of about the, the, the training part of it. And, you know, I, I think the, the answer to that I think is a little bit of – depends on what you want to do. You know, hey, you're talking to a guy that absolutely, I mean, lives and breathes driver training, coaching, helping drivers improve. So, you know, obviously I'm biased towards saying, yeah, go get training. But I'm also biased towards just having fun. And, you know, so I think – you know, you might be, you know, you've obviously got some experience in autocross and that kind of stuff. You know, just go and rent a ride. And I think, Michael, to your point of, of, of you know, kind of letting, you know, working with somebody else's car and team. Uh, you know, I have seen some people that go, okay, we're going to go and get into this jump car or whatever it is. We're going to go out and build a car. And they go out and build a car and then they find out that's maybe not the best car to have built. So I think... You know, you're almost better off going and spending some time, just rent a ride essentially, pay to go and drive somebody else's car, go and do a couple of races. And at that point in time, you're going to go, oh, okay, now based on what I've learned, I want to go and get more driver training, some more training to become a better driver, or I want to go and build this kind of car or whatever. So um, learn from other people's experience first. Definitely. We've got some really great people, like I said, that have have a lot more racing experience than we do. And hopefully we can draw from some of that in 2017 as we want to do more racing. Yeah, you guys, maybe you can, uh, all three of you can be in the car together and you can be talking about it while you're going around. That would be a <laughs> yeah, perfect <laughs> podcast. Oh man, that'd be a logistical nightmare, but we could figure it out. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, so, so I, I, I'm sorry guys, but I, I, so I did a chump car race last year with a couple of good friends, actually, you know, a, a one of the best sports car racers in the world, uh, Colin Braun, um, you know, paid professional driver. His dad is one of the best race engineers in the world, Jeff, uh, Braun and, uh, you know, on their off weekends, they take their Miata out and go and do chump car races. Uh, so I think that's, that's how cool people they are. They're just hardcore motorsport geeks right and uh so i went and did a race with them at road atlanta last year and jeff being the engineer type figured out how to you know uh, live stream the video back into the back into the pit area so <laughs> we could watch uh, real time as the driver was driving around well actually it was about a 15 second delay but but i'm thinking about it going wouldn't it be cool if you guys you know you took turns actually having conversations while you're on track and uh, recorded that and put it, made that one of your podcasts. That'd be really cool. I'd listen to it. It might be one of our YouTube videos. It might be, that. yeah. That would yeah. Be, yeah. That'd be a decent YouTube video set up. I, the company I work for, uh, one of our divisions is is uh, security camera, closed circuit TV stuff. And um, I could get a camera system working if I had to. It wouldn't be that hard, honestly. I like where your head's at. We can make this work. 
So. Yeah, what we used was uh, mounted a mounted an iPhone um, in the car, and then uh, an iPhone back in the back of the trailer uh, that was plugged into a monitor, and uh, through something called I don't forget a live stream something or other, but, you know. Uh, upgraded his data plan for that day. Yeah, that, that would be the tough part. Is, it is, be, it's going to be very right. data intensive. Uh, but that was about it. And it was pretty darn cool. What was cool was, you know, the at first the, the 15 second delay was kind of annoying a little bit. But then it was really cool because, you know, you'd be in the car and one of those, you know, somebody would move across in front of you and it'd be a close call or you'd make some really cool pass passing three cars into one corner. You just get on the radio and go, hey, guys, watch this. So everyone would crowd around <laughs> the screen and watch it. <laughs> Because you could give them a fifteen second uh, notice on it, so yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, so, on kind of a lighter note, I wanted to obviously you've had a vast experience of driving a lot of different cars. Um, you've driven professionally. You've you've driven your own personal cars. I mean, what have been some of your absolute favorite cars to drive in your career and in your personal life? So anybody else's car. <laughs> that's that's, <laughs> that's the, the key. Car to drive. <laughs> yeah. Like like a rental car, it's the fastest one. Exactly. Nothing drives like a rental car. And uh, <laughs> only second to that is somebody else's car to drive on the track. And I say that kind of jokingly, but, you know, to be honest, I have owned one race car in my life. And that was my first two seasons I raced a Formula Ford. And ever since then, I've been, I've driven somebody else's car. Nah, maybe not 100%. My brother and I built a, a car at one point together. Technically, he owned it, but we built it together. Um, but I've always driven other people's cars. So, um, and you know, people often ask me, I mean, you know, what do you drive? What's your daily driver kind of stuff? And kind of thinking that I should be driving some, you know, Ferrari or Porsche or something like that. And, you know, I drive a mini Cooper S and I think the car is a blast. And, you know, for the amount of time that I spend traveling, I can't justify having an expensive car sitting here at home in the garage doing nothing. Um, i you know, if I'm going somewhere, I hop in my mini and I have a blast driving the car, mostly to and from the airport. Um, I guess, you know, if you said, what's the most fun car I've ever driven on a, on a racetrack? Definitely an Indy car. Uh, you know, so a car that weighs 1,500 pounds, has 900 horsepower, and has about, I don't know, I forget what they were at the time, but five or 6,000 pounds of aerodynamic downforce at 180 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, you know, you kind of just go, that adds up to a pretty fun car to drive. Uh, you know, you come out of a corner and you stand on it. And, and I used to use this, you know, uh, analogy of, you know, you, you take a wet bar of soap and you squeeze it and it kind of just goes and it squirts out of your hand. Well, that's what an indie car is like coming out of a corner. It's just like it squirts out of a corner. Sling shots, it's gone. Yeah, and it's just it's. To be honest, I, you know, there are times when I'm at a track and I'm like, you know, do I miss this? Eh, maybe a little bit. But if I go and stand in a corner and I watch an indie car come out of a corner, I go, man, I miss that. That is just the feeling of coming out of a corner with that kind of grunt and power and stick. It's 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 just. Unfortunately, it's something that is so difficult for anybody to imagine what those forces are like that it's um, yeah, it, it, it's hard to explain. But um, when you do it, oh, it's magic. So in past shows, we've talked about I'm a bit of a an arrow and downforce nerd like that. That sort of stuff fascinates me. Uh, and we've talked about specifically like with the newer Viper. ACR and stuff like that, these high downforce cars um, that are more attainable to the general public now, uh, what it's like, like, can you feel downforce holding you in and what it's like to, to know that if I take this corner at 60 miles an hour, I won't stick. But if I take it at 80, I have enough downforce being created that I will stick. Like, is that, is that something you can feel when you're driving? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the goal of driving an aero car. And by the way, last year, uh, was that last September, I was doing a charity event thing. And darn, part of what I had to do was spend a day in a ACR Viper taking people for laps around Thunder Hill. Sounds terrible. Yeah. I don't know how yeah, you made it out in one miserable. piece. You poor guy. I'm surprised you didn't quit. 
but I was doing it for charity. So that's oh, why. that's right. Yeah, that's true. You got to stick <laughs> it out for the kids. Yeah. yeah it's, yep. Exactly. Uh, but you know, uh, so a car like that, um, you know, you feel you feel the grip level, but it's it's more it's more progressive. When you're in a uh, like an open wheel car, um, you know, or a prototype sports car, the progression is more more dramatic. It's more aggressive. So, you know, let's say you're driving an ACR Viper and, you know, there's a certain stick level that you're kind of going, geez, you know, 60 miles an hour. There isn't a lot there. You go to maybe 65 or 68 and you're going, oh, it actually works. It actually works better at this speed. Um, so, you know, a little bit quicker works, you know, in an Indy car, you know, at a certain level, uh, or certain speed you, or a prototype sports car or something like that you know, where that 60 miles an hour might be, it might be that, okay, I'm 60 doesn't, feels a little uncomfortable. I'm going to go 90 and the car will stick better. <laughs> so, and then you get Gosh. to this whole thing of, well, how do you trust that? Like how stupid do you need to be <laughs> to go? If I go one mile an hour, you feel like you're going, if I go one mile an hour faster, I'm going to fall off the track and die. And, you know, and then, um, you know, so you kind of go, okay, well, then let me go 10 or 20 miles an hour faster. There's just this faith or trust that you've got to have in the car. And, you, you know, where it really, I mean, where it really shows like in an Indy car is on an oval track. You know, if you're doing 200 miles an hour or you're doing, you know, 220 miles an hour or something like that, uh, you know, 220 miles an hour, the car might feel almost on the edge and you go 230 and the thing sticks and it, it's just that at that speed it's got to be a big mental block like really do i need to go 230 is it worth it you know it's it's got to be a huge hump 60 to 90 you know hopefully you're going to be okay if something goes wrong but that's, that's, that's got to be one of those just like blind faith you have to, right like your, your race engineer looks at you and goes no seriously go 90 it's gonna work and you just yeah. go okay I'll I'll do it. I will trust you on this. Can that be figured out at least with some level of certainty mathematically? So the simulation simulation programs that the teams use now can figure all that out. Um, You know they they know what can and can't be done pretty much. You You know, know, twenty years ago that wasn't the case. Portion anyway. Yeah. Um, So when you were doing it, were you just let's well, try this and see if it works or rather than the engineer saying it can be done. No, you look over and you go, well, that driver did it. So I'm <laughs> just got to have that one guy. He's crazy just have one, to try one, it. one guinea pig. And if he spins off, okay, we're not doing that. Yeah. So, you know, you guys are, um, you guys are pretty young. Do you guys remember the name Nigel Mansell? I do remember Nigel Mansell. I don't remember. He had so the much mustache, as, as right? I know it. Yep. He yeah, had a uh, huge mustache. <laughs> of course, that's what you would. <laughs> that's like. what I remembered. He's yeah. got a massive mustache. Yep. Yep. So you know he uh, Formula One world champion in what was that? Nineteen ninety two was it? Ninety two? I think it was yeah, somewhere sound, in there. Sounds about right. Yeah. Um, the following year, after he won the Formula One world championship, he moved into Indy cars, and. That was the year that I was doing the full season. So, of course, it was. Why wouldn't I'm it be? around him, and uh, you know, I can still to this day remember going, you know, running Michigan Speedway, which you know at that time we were, you know, I think average speed was, you know, like a, a, a lap was something 230 something miles an hour. You know, you'd be at high 230 something miles an hour on the straightaway, and you keep your foot flat to the floor, and you just turn in. And you go, oh, please stick. Um, <laughs> and I can remember, you know, getting out there the first time and I'm doing, I don't know, 225 or something like that. And I go into turn one and trying to hold my foot down and Mansell comes around the outside of me and just kind of swoops around the outside of me at, you know, literally five, eight miles an hour faster. And I'm going, oh, man, like and you look up and you see the way that dis- the tires are distorted at that kind of loading. And you're thinking, this is crazy. And, you know, then you keep doing a few more laps and a few more laps and a few more laps. And pretty soon you're kind of doing the same kind of thing. I can't say I was as as quick as Mansell, but uh, you're doing the same kind of thing. And part of it, I think, is just, you know, you see somebody else do it and you go, I can do it. 
stupid, but <laughs> that was always that was always our mentality. Like with rollerblading when we were younger too, it's like you go to a skate park, you're like, oh, that trick's impossible. There's no way. Well, then you see, you know, that idiot do it. Oh, well, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> no, I have to. How do dare it. he be better than me? This exactly. is something's Choice. gone wrong here. Yeah, it's a matter exactly. of pride at this point. Yep. Yeah. And is that any different than anything? I mean, rollerblading, skate, skateboarding, you know. Oh, no. It's all the same. Snow, Absolutely. Snowboarding, I mean, all that stuff. I mean, you, somebody does something, you go, huh, okay, well, now I can do that. And then somebody will go, well, what could I do beyond that? So you kind of just keep building on it. Um, but, yeah, when the G-forces are there, it's it's kind of mind-boggling. And, you know, when I said that an indie car is the most fun thing I've ever done in my – fun car that I've ever driven in my life, they're all – also the most work like physically it just beats you up i can't imagine your body hurts um you know i can remember the first time i did the race at phoenix on the one mile oval you know you'd lap that track in about 19 seconds one mile in 19 seconds (laughs) and you're i mean in the corners i remember at phoenix that year um, data was showing that we were pulling 4.6 G's oh in the corner. Oh my nice. gosh. Wow. And you're in that for a couple of seconds, you know, and then you get on a straightaway and then you're in that again for a few more seconds. Then you're getting a little break, but that's happening, you know, twice you're reaching those G forces in 19 seconds and you go out and you, and in the race you do 200 laps. So oh, you're man. spinning around this bowl and at the end of it, you get out of the you get out of the car, and you can't walk because your knees have been twisted sideways from the G forces pushing to the right for so long for two hours, and you're just you get out and you're like, oh, I can't walk, and your knees are killing you because of that. And so they hurt a lot, <laughs> but it's a good hurt. <laughs> and then reporters wonder why you don't want to do a post race interview. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've heard yeah, it yeah. so many times, like. Oh, you don't need to be athletic to drive race cars. Like, yes, really? You do. Go down to to the local indoor go kart track down the street from us here and do a fourteen lap race, and then get back to me on how physical it really is, and then amplify that by, you know, a hundred times. At least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah, send somebody out for ten minutes at an indoor karting place, and they'll be sweating. It's not easy. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. Um, so I might steal a page out of your book, Ross. Um, we were just on your show, so um, why don't you? Is there something that you could share with our audience? You know, we're mainly autocross and maybe some track day, um, track day people, and you know, some other people in different factions. But I mean, is there is there something that you can share from your knowledge base that may be applicable to many people that you see a lot of people do wrong, or you know, what what would kind of be your tip for something for our audience to look at when they're racing to try to improve what they're doing? Uh, so I'll, I'll go, I'll go with two things here actually. And the first one is, it's kind of obvious in a way, but I'm amazed at how many people get into the sport and, you know, it doesn't matter what the sport is, whether it's track days or autocross or whatever it is, uh, time attack, uh, drift. I mean, I don't care what it is. They get in and into it because they want to have fun and they love doing it. And then over time they get caught up in the I don't know. They they make it too serious, and they forget about why they started, and they get caught up in the you know I got to beat this, I got to beat that guy, I got to do this, I got to do that, and it's like no, you don't. You don't got to do nothing. You you know the only thing you you should be doing is enjoying it. And I think you know I I had a, a kind of a big aha moment in my career around the whole fun thing. And when you're having fun, you drive a whole lot better. So sometimes I think it's important just to kind of uh, Step back and remind yourself why you're doing it, and I think that's that's a big part of it. Um, the second part of it, I think, is the second thing I'd say is in you know a big part of my coaching, I, I spend a lot of time around the mental game of, of, of driving, and uh, you know I, a lot of times I'll, I'll ask somebody like, how many times a year do you drive? And somebody will say, well, you know, last year I did six autocross events, or you know I did. Uh, uh, you know, four track days or 10 track days or whatever. And I go, okay, what do you do in your life 10 times a year that you actually get better at? Like, this is a really difficult sport to practice. And, 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 and yet you can practice a gazillion runs or a gazillion laps in your mind. So I think, 
you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of drivers and work with a lot of drivers around using visualization or really mental imagery. And I think using mental imagery in a very deliberate way, you know, sitting down going, okay, I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes getting my mind relaxed, uh, imagining not only what it looks like, but also what it feels like and actually moving my hands and arms and legs and feet and imagining the sounds and making it as real, making it a, a, a reality in your mind. If you do that enough times, it can be as effective as physically doing it. And in fact, sometimes it's better because you don't make mistakes or you shouldn't make mistakes in your mind. So I, you know, and guess what? It doesn't cost a penny to do. So when people say the sport is, you know, it's too expensive to go and practice. Well, practice it in your mind because it doesn't cost a penny. So I'd say those are the two things. Have fun and use the mental, your mental imagery to uh, practice more. It's those funny. Good. It's funny because uh, my driver's ed teacher when I was 15 years old in high school, who at the time I didn't know, but it turns out is a uh, BMW Club of America instructor. Didn't know that at the time, but I remember him telling us in class that um, one of the things we were supposed to do is we were supposed to go home and just think about, you know, whatever it was about driving that we weren't good at. What I mean, you know, as a 15 year old kid, that's just, you know, parallel parking or, you, you know, staying in your lane or whatever that might be. But just thinking about it, you will get better doing it. And for some weird reason in life in general, that specific statement has stuck with me since then. So and it's interesting that, so when I was 15 and I was in school, I, I, you know, I went into my, my phys ed teacher's office and there was a magazine there around and, and the front cover story was around athletes using visualization. And I remember taking it and reading it and it had a big impact. I mean, probably since that day to, to today, there probably has not been more than a day here and there where I've not done mental imagery for something, whether it's driving or, you know, preparing to go and do a presentation or whatever. But uh, I'd say 98% of those days have been spent imagining driving around a track somewhere. <laughs> it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. That's good advice. And and to kind of elaborate on that having fun thing too, I, I think – I don't know how much I've outwardly outwardly expressed this on the show. Adam could tell me because he always listens to all the shows. But you know, I've I've expressed some frustration with the culture surrounding um, some racing at a local level. And at the end of the day, racing at a local level, especially in autocross, is really nothing more than to have fun. Um, I mean, you can compete and have fun at the same time. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, I think it's important to remember that you personally should have fun, and then if you personally have fun, it helps everybody else to have fun as well. And, and why else are we doing this if not to just have a good time and meet new people and experience new things and you know, kind of mutually enjoy something together? And we shouldn't, we shouldn't make it anything more than it is. At the end of the yeah. day, this is not yeah, life or death. We're not curing cancer here. We're not. Exactly. No. Yep. We're just trying to have fun and you know maybe escape from daily lives and and work and chores and and this and that and and we should keep that in mind. And when we go to the track or to autocross or whatever, let's let's have a good time and mutually enjoy that. And it's funny. I mean, you guys, I'm sure you you guys relate to this. Is you know, I hear people say. Driving a car in autocross or on a track is the most relaxing thing I could ever do. And, you know, people say, you know, I go to work and I tell people about driving around a racetrack at, you know, 120 miles an hour and I say it's relaxing and they, people look at me like I'm weird. Well, it is. It's just so focused and, you know, nothing else matters when you're there, right? Uh, and, and I think that's why it's so enjoyable and relaxing. So, yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ross, it has been a pleasure and an honor. We really appreciate it very much. Um, what, uh, what should we hit real quick before we end the show? Obviously you have your new podcast, but, uh, go ahead and tell our listeners where they can find you and what you've got going on. You know, pretty much, uh, just go to speedsecrets.com and everything is there. <laughs> you know, I, I, I have tried to create this, this, package or this program of resources for drivers of every level and so on my website there are free driving tips you know on youtube there's free driving tips there's 
you know, free eBooks. There's eBooks that you might have to spend two dollars and ninety nine cents for. There's other books. There's webinars. There's the podcast. I mean, I basically try to help drivers in as many different ways, and you know, some of it's free. Some of it, uh, I got to pay to live, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so uh, frustrating. I haven't figured out how to live for free yet. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so if you just go to speedsecrets.com, you'll find everything and links to Facebook and Twitter and all that other kind of stuff as well. So um, yeah, uh, thanks for having me on here. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun how many more motorsport podcasts are coming out. And, uh, you know, I guess I've just jumped on the bandwagon and having some fun with it. Absolutely. Sounds good. Um, for our listeners, I think we're going to do a quick transition into the news. Uh, but Ross, we will let you go for now. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Robbie, let's do the news. All right, we'll start this off with uh, Ferrari now has its own name for catching on fire. So where did this come from? Does this happen at, uh, this happened at Le Mans, right? No, Daytona. No, Daytona. Daytona. So this is the second year in a row that one of the Corvette cars has lit on fire. And not even during the race. Not during Fine. testing. Nope. During the roar before the 24. What a ridiculous name. That's, but That's what they call it. I, I know, I know. It just is what it is. But it is re- the roar before the 24 test day. There's some non-automotive marketing person who that thought that that sounded it, cool. Buzzworded it rhymes. And Do you know that roar before and 24 all rhyme? And they all threw the papers up in the air and said, yes. We're done here. We're, yes. The, en- the engines are loud. Solid. You're right. <laughs> Wow, good job, the, Frank. The neighbors were complaining about the roar at the 24, and now now it's the now thing. it's the thing. So uh, I think it's the number four, which also runs yeah, the number four Corvette. Corvette. Man, um, somebody stop us! Yeah, it's caught Did on you fire. Know we were for breaking out a rap career here. No, oh, no, please don't. So for the second <laughs> year in a row, the Corvette has caught on fire, um, and it sounds like Steph Schrader from Jalopnik was talking, or Black Flag, or whoever she works for, was talking to one of the Ferrari team members. And they have a joke going around their paddock that says, don't pull a Corvette. Which is pretty ironic coming from Ferrari. Hugely ironic, which is why it's hilarious. The only more ironic company to come from would be Porsche. I don't know where you've got this, but I think Ferrari's had more fire issues. The GT3, though, the 991 GT3, I think, is the one that was causing all the problems. And they were, like, all catching on fire. Yeah, they had to recall, and I think it was 2014, they recalled 724 911s. GT3s, and they had to replace the engines. How pissed would you be if you bought a 991, you order your GT3, right? You finally got your money put together, you put it down on a GT3, and you get one that's potentially going to catch on fire, so you have to take it back, and it gets a new engine. Now, if you're a Porsche nerd or like a, you know, one mm-hmm. of those people, now you have a potentially collectible car that has a replacement engine in it. Is that annoying? I don't, that seems annoying. I don't think the replacement engine, it's not like it's going to hurt the value or anything because... Well, I'm sure know, the f- legacy of that car is kind of tainted to begin with if they if they had a... It know, was a fact. It's not like... Factory recall. Yeah, it's not like I did it of my own accord. It was all... They're all that way, so it shouldn't affect it. You think so? You think it's the same like on the, you know, well, 40 years from now, if you can... Yeah. If you can find one still, you think you want to, you'd probably want to find one that was post recall, though. I, I would imagine that people are going to want, yeah, they definitely want to. Because numbers matching. I mean, I know it's factory and you got the paperwork and all that bullshit, but it's like no, you, people get caught up in this numbers matching thing. Like, it's is this the engine that came in it from the factory? Is no, that really a thing anymore, though, with modern cars? This numbers matching? Oh, yeah, term? for sure. For sure. Especially like. Is that still. Yeah, because I think those guys down in uh, uh, Arizona, Scottsdale, they still spend stupid amounts of money on numbers matching Mopars. I mean, that's still yeah, like the thing. Well, no, no, I know old cars, but when yeah. you have a brand new car, is it can it is it possible to know that's not the original motor? Because they, sh- do I, they date code them and stuff like they used to? I don't know yeah, that they do uh, yeah, that they stuff do. anymore. Do oh they? yeah, like any any major manufacturing facility, like especially with automotive, like aerospace is the same way. Uh, serial numbers mean everything. Like you can tell when it was made, by who, you know, all this stuff, where it came from. It has to be for quality ha- control. Yeah, it has to be lot traced. So like, I sh- I should be able to open the hood of a Porsche, pull the numbers off of that engine, compare it to the number of on that car, your VIN number, all that stuff, and you should be able to tell you exactly what happened to that car. Now with the new engine, you'll you'll probably have a separate number, and you'll yeah you'll put them together and go. Well, this car came with you know this engine got recalled. Now it has this engine. Well, yeah, not only that, but if you search the VIN of that car, you'll see a recall. Yes. And then you'll start asking questions about whether or not the engine's been replaced and stuff like that. So I, I, I personally would be annoyed if I had spent 
140 grand or whatever on my GT3 and then I had to get a replacement engine. That's just well, me, like but Richard Hammond. <laughs> yeah, he had one. He didn't even get it, did he? I think he had it. Or no, and he had, had it, but it was back. instructed to not drive it for risk of Yeah, fire. that's what it was. That's he had it, it, but so he couldn't drive it. So he in his garage, it. but he wasn't allowed but to drive it. But I don't think they had a solution for it yet, so it just had to sit there. How yeah. pissed would you be? Well, I mean, that's what, that's what I was saying. Still- these super, you know, like these high-performance Italian cars or like, you know, European cars, where they all they care about is like the aerodynamics and, the, and they don't really take into account the general public using them. So like with Porsche or like the Ferraris, you know, you go to a gas station and the filler neck is next to the uh, top mounted exhaust. So when you spill gas on it, it lights on fire. <laughs> I mean, that's and that's basically what like the nine, the Porsche 918 Spider, like that was a, a another fire issue, which is why, again, I, I associate Porsches with fires. <laughs> not, not, not Ferraris so. had historically had way more issues with cars catching on fire. Ferrari and Lambo have had that historically more than Porsche to me. Oh, see, I, I was, I, I never really. Associated I think, them. I with think Porsche. Uh, Adam means over like a extended period of yeah, time, whereas beginning. Porsches in the last three years for yes. some reason seem to catch would, on fire. I would agree that in the last three to five years, Ferrari has not had that problem as much as Porsche has had that problem. Right. But in the prior twenty years before that, it was all Ferrari and some <laughs> Lambos, right. not Corvette. Italians. <laughs> here's the thing about Italian cars: they make the best cars a human being can make, briefly. <laughs> it's a they're, brilliant car and then it catches on fire for a little while or the carburetors clog up or you know what I mean it's just something but it's great for I think they've gotten in, in a better. perfect world they're right. the best it's but the then best in reality car. it's not the best you car. put a, on, you know, a normal paper, human next to it it's the perfect car exactly it is, right. exactly exactly um, but, but so them using this terminology saying that don't Corvette it I is hilarious because I'm calling karma I'm calling Karma right now. You think yeah. the Corvette yep. team was making fun of Ferrari? No, 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 no. Karma's a bitch, and it's coming. It's coming for, for Ferrari. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, yeah, they Mar- should. They should be like, man, that sucks, dude. Sorry about that. Like, Is there anything we can? Yeah, like, can we they, help you? you got we're trailer? experts with preventing our cars. Yeah, if, from if there was you fire, have fire extinguishers on your side, okay, Would you just like want to borrow one. Do you want to what can we bring do extra with us? I mean, this is definitely Ferrari mentality. Like they're dicks to be dicks since the beginning of time. But you know, maybe maybe it's. You've had problems with fires in the past. Maybe it's best not to just bring attention to yourself. Just let it go. Right. Like, yeah. I, you know, I'm it's sorry to hear that. the same reason that I make sure to get out of the ambulance's way yes. when I'm driving. Because someday I'm going to be in that ambulance, let's face it, and I need everyone to get out of my way. Yeah, it's karma. It's karma. <laughs> um, so anyway, I guess there were a couple Corvette cars because they finished fourth and ninth in GTLM. So they didn't do terribly, no. but a um, couple of the cars finished anyway. Did you guys look at any of the other standings for GTLM? I did not. Uh, Ford GT was first. Yep. And the Porsche 911 RSR, the mid-engine 911 that they don't want to talk about. Yeah, Porsche doesn't want to call it mid-engine. They have uh, this thing about it. I don't know what their deal is. That came in second, but did you see how closely one was, and two were? Wasn't that like .06 or something crazy? It was three seconds over 652 laps. That's not three even... Seconds. Even in they the were, last couple of years, that's not even the closest those was, have been, though. Wasn't all the classes really close this year? Like, from top it to bottom? It sounded like it was really good racing That's the crazy thing to me about these 24-hour races now, or, or 12-hour races, just if endurance anything. racing in general, is that they're racing from start to finish. It's not just like... You know, biding your time and then hopefully it's not a race of attrition anymore. Yeah, it, it's not like in the sixties where whoever survived won. Yeah. Yeah. They were, I mean they were talking about with the drivers, they were like, I was pushing it and pushing, it. I was trying to catch that Ford GT and it was all I could do and I couldn't do you know, I was like they're racing at the end. They're not you know, and, and obviously they turn up the the wick at the end because what is it in the last thirty minutes, what's it matter? But I mean, it's amazing you have a car left to do that with at that yeah. point. It's engineering. It is engineering, marvels. especially when you turn up with Ford GT, which is this is the second season, right? Yep. Which, yep. which, if you uh, listen to episode one, I called this. You called this. I called this that it was going to win. I said last year. It's true, he did. Last year on episode one, I said that they had they just they're repeating history. So their first year out, they had problems. The second year, they were going to decimate all. Direct quote. But they did win Lamar their first year. That's true. So I, I got that part wrong, but I got Daytona right. Um, I think there was all, that's all there was to say about that. We can transition straight into uh, Jeff Gordon and Cadillac won at Daytona. That's pretty cool. Win overall? 
one two. Yeah, one two. That's pretty sweet that Cadillac got a one two on their first race back um, at Le Mans, and Jeff so, Gordon was in the winning team. Did you know that this is not, not Jeff Gordon's first or, time? At, damn it, Daytona was my Daytona? problem. I think did we, didn't we talk about that in the? Oh, yeah, when we talked about his retirement, we talked about him doing that, and we also thought that his retirement is probably the best thing ever because now he gets to just have fun at racing, and clearly it's working out for him. Yeah, obviously. I, th- I think this is the coolest thing he's done in his career. I know that's sacrilege to a lot of people, but you look at like you look at NASCAR, and then you know prototype I, racing. But then going to prototype racing for Cadillac in a brand new car, and then winning straight out of the gate and being that's, part of a one-two team. This is the first race that car has seen, and period. it won. Full stop. Like win overall, first in class, first in race, that's impressive. It is impressive. That's very, very well executed. I think it's... That's damn near unheard of. Like, that just doesn't happen. It really kind of is. Like, you don't get it right the first time. No, not really. Especially in endurance racing. No. But this this was a close race, too, I heard. I think think there was a questionable pass near the the end of the race. Didn't he tag somebody? Yeah, like, uh, gosh, what was it like... I think he hit a car and spun him off. Hit like the number five car and spun him yeah, off. He tagged, he, he tagged somebody early in the race too. Oh, did he uh, really? On cold tires, overestimated his braking zone, and someone had just come back off a pit and was going too slow. You know, because they just coming off a pit lane, so they hadn't got up to, to speed yet. race speed yet, and yep. they were in the braking zone. And he tapped the back of him and spun him out. Really, and continued on. Not his. I mean, yes, his fault, but not sure. You know. And this sounded like it, this when he tagged the number five car near the end. I think that was um, it was yeah, it was ten minutes to go, and he went for a gap that was open for like a second, and then the second he went for for going for that gap, he closed the door on him. So I mean, he, there's there's arguments on all over the internet on who was at fault here. Was Albuquerque closed? Like, did he leave it open and he went for the gap, and did Albuquerque close it? Like, was he going off of the race line? You know, what I mean, so he goes, who was at fault? Taylor Albuquerque. So. It depends on who you ask. But he didn't get penalized for it. He did so, not. Yeah. That's kind of just racing in general. Anytime there's contact, almost, well, I shouldn't say anytime, but a lot of times if there's contact, there's there's somebody who's going to argue it's one way or the other. So yep. it just depends on who you're cheering for at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what else we got, Rabbi? Um, EBR, which is the Eric, Eric, Buell. Eric Buell Racing or Eric Buell Motorcycles now. Um, they're closing again, almost to the year of their announcement of the production of net last year's run. Yeah, so they're slowing down production this week. They're starting to wind it down. This is a bummer, man. I was pumped when he said he was going to come back now for like the third time because yeah. he's he's a brilliant engineer, and I don't know the inner workings of this company. I'm sure as as things progress, we'll learn more about what exactly failed. But he's a brilliant engineer. He's just not the best sales guy, and he's not the best businessman. No. But he makes fucking awesome bikes. He makes fast bikes. Do you think that somebody who is that guy would latch on to him and just go for it? I well, thought that's what... Wasn't that what this was, though? I thought he had a business partner. But Yeah, this has happened multiple times. Like, he had a business partner with Harley-Davidson when they made Buells. But they kind of, like, but that, stripped Buell of its I'm essence sure, and, you know, yeah. trying to turn him into, like, a sub-Harley brand and, and then kind of ripped the rug out from underneath them and spun mm-hmm. him off again and, you know, that. And maybe that's... Some of that is Eric maybe wasn't the best businessman and maybe didn't have the best attorneys and so on and so forth. So he could be to blame for some of that too. But yeah, yeah so this time last year they were announcing the 2016 bikes and um, they had financial backing, like I think it was like in the millions. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then in the in the year since they've basically lost everything. They've liquidated their assets. It sounds like. Um, I didn't cut, know cut prices on every bike that was still for sale. I mean, they had terrible sales this year. I was gonna say I like, couldn't find the exact numbers, but they were horrible. Did anybody buy a bike? Is you know I've never seen one of these. Are you gonna the buy the bike that's from the company that's failed for the third time? You know, no. I mean, not. not I understand like that you you would argue like oh you, there are the V twin sport bike guys and then you got the inline four sport bike guys. Mm-hmm. But if I mean if you put the reduced price of these was the same price as a brand new R one. It's no question. I'm taking the R1. I mean, that, that's just because per- you know it's going to be there. That's it's personal got- preference for me. I prefer that bike, anyways. But for the same price, I'm gonna I'm gonna go it's with that hard. bike. Yeah. I mean, he's built race bikes that are substantially faster than other manufacturers' bikes. Um, so he has a history of building great race motorcycles. 
it's just how good of a business. Are you going to be here two years from now when I need parts? You know, if I'm yeah, going to drop, big thing. if I'm going to drop thirteen grand or whatever on a bike, I want to know I can at least run it for a couple of years, three years, something like that. Is you know? he using someone else's motors? Who is making? Do we have any idea who is making his motors? I honestly can't remember. I, I don't can't remember. Either. I know it's kind of it's kind of unique, but because it is a, a a V twin and it was like a Harley motor, I think when it was Buell. But I don't know if that's still the case with him being on his own. Yeah, I didn't really get many of the details of the new bike. Maybe they just didn't have the it, marketing it, money, you know? It wasn't much different than, like, it, it looks like a redesigned right. Buell. Yeah. 1195, I don't know what they were called. Yeah. I just remember I crashed one. <laughs> <laughs> was I, that, I, was I, that rider fault or bike fault? Yes. Manufacturer fault. Actually, it was probably my fault, just lack of experience, but I was also, dr- that. I never got comfortable on that bike. The, the, the V-Twin... Just it handles differently than obviously a, a standard you know, inline four. Yep. So like I went from the closest bike I ever drove that was next to it would be an R6, which is quite a bit smaller. But, but you know, just power band dramatically different. Different power band. Yep. Definitely. That engine is different. I assume they're way lower power band. Yeah, the V twins are extremely torquey. So like for comparison, an R1 has like 150 horsepower and 72 foot pounds of torque. A Buell. 1190 or whatever they're called has 150 horsepower and like 150 torque or you know, right. or 102 torque or something but it's more it's it's, it's, it's i can't it, it doesn't sound like a lot more but then when you're talking about going from 80 to like 105 that's a big jump yeah, you know I, mean, I, think, I think it was so 105 light. was it yeah so it, you know we're talking 25 30 percent difference changes and, everything and it revs differently the way that it builds revs is different than you know an inline four Japanese motor, which just at the bottom there's not a lot happening, but you get past five thousand RPM and it just rips. I mean, it just wants to tear away. You know, it's when you're seeing them wheelie in, and and that's where all of your speed is is above five thousand RPM. Yes. So, I guess I, I was kind of looking into this more because to me I always thought like a V twin sport like that sounds stupid, but it's there's a huge following Ducati bro yeah Ducati yeah. Uh, Aprilia Aprilia yep I, I can't never pronounce that uh R, the RC got one of those the RC fifty ones which is a is a really cool bike yep. um you don't see they didn't make them for very long but they were V twins very fast terrifyingly fast yep so they're they're out there I mean there, there's a case for a V twin twin sport bike but. Uh, what else we got? Uh, the upcoming Volkswagen GTIs will have an electric motor, but not in the traditional sense. This is kind of cool. This is interesting to see this technology on like a consumer level car. Did you look into this very closely? No, because I, I spent way too much time looking into the EBRs. So they were talking about... He was like, oh, Volkswagen. Fucking Volkswagen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks well, for, well thanks, actually... Thanks for backing me up, bro. Well, I thought... I, <laughs> I think it's a good idea because they clearly can't do anything with emissions, so they should definitely focus on something they without emissions. Do, they should do something that doesn't involve the word diesel. Yeah. Oh, I think that's anything for sure. Different. Let's do something different. Anything without emissions is a right. good idea. Electric for engines. That's where it's don't at. Don't emit No emissions. Things. Yep. Uh, so they're going to make, I think the regular Golf's going to have a 48-volt um, electric system of some kind. Mm-hmm. Um I don't think the details are very clear about what exactly the type of hybrid that's it, going to be. It's yet. the uh, starter motor system. But it's going to be a supplemental type of yes. power. So start, stop, obviously. Tor- yeah, um, maybe. Overboost, stuff like that. And then in the GTI, they're going to have a, an electric, um, basically an electric turbocharger or an electric supercharger, however you want to look at that. So it's going to have an electric motor that spins a turbine of some kind to cause forced induction. Which is kind of interesting. Isn't that kind of like the Formula One, like, uh, not just, is it like the anti leg system that kind of keeps it in boost? It's, I think it's like, a, I think it, it regenerates power off of the braking and then it keeps the, en- the engine in boost. But in that, doesn't, isn't it a traditional turbo from the sense that it has its exhaust gas driven? I think so. Okay. I, th- I think the, the anti leg is what keeps it in boost. If I understand this correctly, this is just forced induction via an electric motor. So basically, a supercharger. Like think of a, think of a, um, like a Paxton supercharger. Mm-hmm. What, what's what, why can't I think of what that's called? Um, centrifugal. Yeah, tr- centrifugal supercharger with an electric motor. So electrically driven as opposed to driven by the the belt. You know, the serpentine right. belt. So I don't know. I just think it's an interesting idea. It's interesting to see that technology at a consumer. You know, a reasonable consumer level. 
I can't say that I'm super on board with Volkswagen, who <laughs> does not have uh, the best electronics track record, giving me essentially a electric boost production system. I'm not I'm not sure I, I'm super on board with them doing it. I think the key is to lease it well, and I, then make it somebody else's problem when it's done. That's Volkswagen 101. Don't buy a Volkswagen, Robbie. Oh, I never really Lease it. I never <laughs> Lease it. Love it. Give it away. <laughs> Next person. That's their problem. I, no. This is have, your problem now, have bro. My, have my off-warranty problem. Here you go. This is yours now. I, I'll just avoid all that and not buy that. Okay. That's fair. What else we got, Robbie? And we'll wrap this up with uh, exciting fun news. McLaren and BMW are teaming up again to build engines for They're the back. future. They're back, futuristic Robbie. engines They're back. that are going to have more power futuristic. and less emissions. For those, yeah, that's that's what they use to describe that, huh? Well, it's, it's the engine of the engine of the future. Okay. For those that don't know, McLaren and BMW teamed up to make the engine for the F1, or really BMW designed provide, it, yeah, provided, provided the, the engine, engine. Um, under McLaren's direction. Um, so interesting. Did you know that Isuzu almost made the engine for the McLaren F1? Really. Yeah, so when when Gordon Murray was looking for an engine designer, he had very specific parameters for what he wanted. Um, I think I have them here. Actually, I wrote them down. Let me see here. He wanted um, an engine that made at least 550 bhp, was 23.6 inches long, and only weighed 551 pounds. And so originally, and it had to be derived from a race engine. Right. That was the other thing. So he originally went to Honda because you know that would that would make sense. Um, for them, to, they could have designed an engine. And I don't know exactly what happened there, but they weren't able to provide something anyway. So then Isuzu was, I think, in the process of getting back into F1. So they potentially had the technology, but they didn't have any track record. And obviously, Isuzu stuck around in F1, right? Clearly. You know about the Isuzu gonna, F1 team. I was yeah. going to say, wait, get back? You mean they were in it at some point? Right, exactly. this is new they were, they were definitely at some events. Yes, exactly. Um, Okay. So he decided that maybe wasn't the best idea. Um, So then at that point, he went to BMW, and they were able to produce an engine that made... It made more power than it was like... I think the production model made 627 horsepower. Um, It weighed about 30 pounds more, but it met space parameters. Right, and it made a bunch more power, so that's why they ended up going with that. So it'll be interesting to see what they actually produce. Yeah, and they're not doing this alone either. They're being... uh Partnered with Granger, Warall, who is a lightweight casting company, uh, Ricardo, which is McLaren's uh, current manufacturing partner, and then Lentis Composites, also uh, the University of Bath. So they're gonna they, so, they're getting funded from the government as well. Yeah. So if they do research for improving emissions, the UK government provides funding, yes. which obviously BMW could not do on their own because they're Germans. <laughs> right. So, and and the other interesting thing about this is that this seems to be flavor of the month because Aston Martin is using AMG engines. And so I wonder if there's something going on there. It's it's clear that partnering when it comes to R&D can be mutually beneficial, cheaper, yes. especially with the upcoming emissions regulations, whether they change or don't change, well, depending on your political views. But regardless... They have to find a way to become more efficient moving forward. Germany signed a bill that says you can't; they will not allow a an internal combustion engine to be sold in Germany by like twenty twenty five or something like that. That's a crazy thought, right? That's very bizarre. That that it might be thirty five, but I'm Either pretty way, sure it's twenty five. That's kind of like a major manufacturing core for the country. I feel like that's going to be something that they keep pushing back. You almost have to. They they set it in stone to try and make make their manufacturing companies achieve that, but when they don't, they'll just push it back another 5 years, another 10 years. They'll just It's the same thing with the EPA fines. It's like yeah. this isn't obtainable. We'll just pay the fine. And the market doesn't want it. No. You know what I mean? The the market with the way that gas prices are, wants to buy internal combustion engines, and they want a V8, and they want a supercharger, and they want you know, and and people, people pay the gas guzzler tax. I mean, they, they don't they don't care until it gets prohibitively expensive. They're just going to keep paying the fine because it's making them money. Why would you do something that's not that potentially may not make you money, 
when everybody else is in the market producing the engines that people want and making money. And the fine's not that big. No. As we talked about when we yeah. talked about Ferrari and Aston Martin, how stupidly small their <laughs> fine was. <laughs> compared to the especially compared to the price of the car. Exactly. You could just work that into the price. This is laughable. The, the price of your DB11 has gone up $50, sir. And he will say, what? I didn't, what did you just say to me? They don't care. But we also give you a, f- a free hat, so it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. We're gonna, you, you'll make out on the, on the back end. So if they're teaming up with a composite company to build engines, are they making carbon fiber engines? They're going to make a carbon fiber engine, Robbie. I'd be okay with that. That'd be nice. Be lightweight, <laughs> strong. Super li- lightweight. Uh, it's thermal components would be okay, because I don't know. You're just not, making shit up, right? I am. Just no. because you're an engineer doesn't mean you can come I on could, the show. I can throw jargon at you all day long. Probably Jeez. can. Yeah. Is there anybody that could verify any of the bullshit that you tell us on the show? Not in real time. And that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it, isn't it? I think so. Boom. It's been an eventful show of many things. Yes. It's been a great day. It has been a great day. It's been, it was a great honor to talk to Ross, definitely. He's, uh, he's a name even before I really started racing very much. He's just a name. His name is just out there. It's just, oh, absolutely. You're talking about racing, and Ross Bentley is integrated into that somewhere. And so when you get an email from him, you kind of squeal like a little girl. You geek out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. I get it. And uh, it just happens. So, um, Did you ever think two years ago that you'd be chilling in your living room talking to Ross Bentley no, because over Skype? No, because we talked so we. You know, we were we talked to him for however long, you know, um, maybe an hour and 15 minutes by the time we did his show and then did our show. But then, like, we talked before that. We talked after that. Like, we bullshitted with Ross Bentley about nothing, you know, after the fact. And it wasn't like, well, guys, I got to go. This was a shit show. I got to get out. You know I mean? so, it was like, he was, he was cool. And I think I think it went well. And, and um, no, I, no, I wouldn't have imagined any of that. It's such a... <laughs> 2017 is starting off with a bang. It's such a big day. He's... I mean, oh, man. Dropping hashtag, shit. Hashtag yep. real journalism. Hashtag real journalism. I'm dropping shit, so it's time to get out of here. I think so. Let's wrap this up. Uh, make sure to find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we got our YouTube channel. We got 1010spodcast.com. Buy a uh, shirt. Buy a shirt. They're out there. Get with a the, coffee mug. If you're listening now, you Maybe missed out on the Jabay shirt. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, we got the new logo shirts up, though. And um, I think that's it. We will catch you guys next week. 